As the sun rose on the 2012-2013 men's basketball season at 20th and Olney, expectations were high, higher than any season in recent memory. The Explorers returned a full cast of characters from the previous season's 21-win NIT team, sans its leading scorer, Earl Pettis. Nonetheless, the blue and gold boasted one of the nation's deepest and most talented backcourts. The squad was anchored by senior Ramon Galloway, known for his highlight reel dunks and pinpoint accuracy from long range, and junior point guard Tyreek Duran, the team's unquestioned floor general. Coupled with burgeoning sophomore big men Steve Zack and Big Five Rookie of the Year Jarrell Wright, the preseason message was simple. Last year was good, but all sights were set on the NCAA tournament's distant shore. We made it to the NIT last year, so our goal is to make it to the NCAA um, this year. Um, so we're just going to work hard. Despite the well-warranted optimism on campus, the Explorers faced an uphill climb with the additions of Butler and VCU to an already reputable Atlantic 10 Conference. Both squads had experienced immense success in recent years and had become national darlings due to their unique styles of play and NCAA tournament runs. But before reaching A-10 play, LaSalle stared headlong at a 13-game non-conference slate one of its most competitive in years. It all began on Saturday, November 10th, against the Delaware Blue Hens in a game that featured a raucous homecoming crowd and unlikely late game heroics from the biggest man in the arena. You know, we played Delaware last year and we lost to them. And uh, it was kind of like a revenge game for us. So it, it wasn't just, you know, an opening game. And uh, we just didn't go out there and play. We wanted to win. It was one of the many games where I thought our fans had uh, an impact on us winning the game. Uh, the atmosphere always set the um, tone for the game. Knowing that you got a pet crowd, they're going to get hype after every bucket that you make. So I think that just feeds on more energy to everybody. The Explorers held a six-point lead at intermission, but that evaporated in the second half as Delaware led with less than six minutes remaining. Then sophomore Steve Zack put the men in gold on his broad shoulders. Uh, I had been telling everyone how hard Steve Zack had worked in the offseason and what wonderful improvement we saw from him. And Steve Zack was a huge factor in us winning that game. It was a little of a bit of a breakout game for him. It, it gave our fans the chance to see just how hard he had worked and what a high level player he had become. And it was great for us to see Steve have such a huge role in that game. As satisfying as the win was, the Explorers would receive a wake-up call in the form of a Blue Devils shooting spree eight days later. After blowing out Central Connecticut State a year prior in their gym, the visit from the Blue Devils seemed all but a sure victory for the Explorers. The visitors came with a vengeance, however, and proved that no team can be taken for granted. Unfortunately, I think that uh, our team was among the number of people who thought that we, we might be able to win the game uh, easily again. As we found out, we, we got beat at home. And looking at the tape, our, our defense was not as bad as we had thought. Central Connecticut was a little bit better than we thought. Our coaches, our players, and our, uh, and our fans, I'm sure, were disappointed with that loss. There's a number of lessons. First, anyone can beat anyone in Division I basketball. Everyone has good players. And that's a real powerful lesson for our team. I think that loss helped us improve our three-point shooting defense to be one of the best three-point shooting defensive teams in the country. Most importantly, I think, after that game, our guys really came into games with a great sense of urgency. With the home loss to Central Connecticut State in the rearview mirror, Coach Giannini established a year-long goal, one which the Explorers met each and every time during the regular season. A very important goal that we almost reached this year was never to lose two games in a row. As long as we don't lose two games in a row, we'll most likely be an NCAA tournament team. So the key thing is, how do you react to losses? And really, if you can avoid back-to-back -back losses through the course of a season, you're probably going to have a great year. The next opportunity came at Hartford, the old stomping grounds of redshirt freshman Rohan Brown. Brown starred at East Catholic, a prep school on the outskirts of Hartford, and returning home in front of dozens of familiar faces was an opportunity he embraced. 
It was only Rohan's third game of his college career. He put up a double-double. He was a huge part of us winning the game. Um, it felt really good to be back home. I had a lot of, um, of my family in the stands, my old high school coach, so it was good to be back. And it was really a thrill for me to see him going back to the Hartford area, his hometown, in front of his grandfather and his mom, and to really have a great game. Ball not on the floor, and Rohan Brown running the floor, gets a couple of points in his hometown. Next on the docket for the blue and gold was a familiar opponent from the main line, and revenge was on the minds of the players leading into the matchup against their big five rival. That game meant a lot to our team, not just for the obvious reasons. It also meant a lot to our team because we had lost to Villanova the two previous years. In both games, we had them down. We were beating them pretty good. We just couldn't finish off the game. This year, the game was the exact opposite. We were down going into the last minute. The Explorers never led in the second half and trailed by as many as 11. But in the game's most pivotal moment, the man with the cool hand ignited an earthquake in the doing. arena. Nine seconds, deep three, tie games! Uh, after I hit that shot, the first thing I noticed was that the, the floor started shaking. He got a great backdoor basket to, to win the game. Well, I thought my mom kept thinking I was going to miss it. That's how wide open I was. <laughs> I'm glad that you got over real quick. And out of all my years that I've been at the side, I never once had that experience. I never felt the floor shake. So that's like that was one thing that let me know how important this game was to our fans and like how exciting it was to everybody. Just to just to understand that that we're here and we we beating teams that we haven't beaten in years, it, it meant a lot for LaSalle and, and for me as a player. The Explorers traveled to Lawrenceville, New Jersey four days later and defeated the Ryder Bronx 63-52. LaSalle led wire to wire and was paced by a 20-point outing from Tyreek Duran. He's a better version of Tyreek. He plays the exact same way. He's not trying to score anymore. He'll take whatever the defense gives him. The mecca of college basketball, a BCS opponent, and a national television opportunity awaited the Explorers on December 5th against Penn State. To help celebrate the university's 150th anniversary, the Explorers sported throwback uniforms, much to the delight of alumni in attendance and watching nationwide. It doesn't get much better than playing a Big Ten team uh, in the Palestra. It was great. Anytime you play in the Palestra, that's like the mecca of basketball. Uh, we got in some early foul trouble, and in the second half, we were able to pull ahead and had one of our best three-point shooting games of the year. Leading by only four at the half, LaSalle outscored the Nittany Lions by 21 in the second period en route to win 82-57 win. Tyreek Duran drained a career-high 29 points in the place where he always seems to make his mark. Tyreek had one of the greatest games in there. Every time Tyreek played in there, he played good. So. Good this time, 15 on the shot clock. Duran open, takes a shot. I actually don't know why I played so well there. I, pretty much every game I played in my career, I done had a good game there since this goes back to high school. I and mean, I know. Ty and Ramon, they always mess with me, like, yeah, the Palestra is my second home. Every time we have a game there, I always do good. And one, Tyreek Durant! The game was especially meaningful for one explorer with a strong personal tie to the Penn State basketball program. One of the players that I knew that the Penn State game was very important to was Taylor Dunn. His father was the head coach at Penn State. He grew up on the Penn State campus. Taylor Dunn is a good player and a great person, and great teams need great people. He came into that Penn State game and played great, and I know it meant a lot for, to him. Uh, he's helped us so much, and, and I was just really happy to see Taylor get rewarded in, in that very meaningful Penn State game, not only with a great team win, but with him being a big part of it. Coming off four consecutive wins, the Explorers were set to pay Boston a visit, home of the Northeastern Huskies. I think that was one of our biggest games of the year, actually, just because it was on a roll in a tough environment. I mean, their fans was giving us hell all, all game. A neck-and-neck -neck affair from the get-go, the Explorers had possession of the ball with the game knotted at 64. What ensued sent the LaSalle bench into a celebration and turned Matthews Arena into a cemetery. <laughs> Um, 
I mean, when you hit a buzzer beater or a big time shot, when you're on the road, like even if it's just a regular three and the team is going on a run and you just silence their crowd with a big three, I think it just sucks the energy out of the gym as far as like for their fans. And I think when I hit that shot, I just felt the, the whole gym got completely silent, except for the little small section that LaSalle had behind our bench. And the great thing about Tyreek Duren is when you put the ball in his hands, he's going to make a great decision. That's the kind of game I came to expect from Tyreek when I recruited him. He played the same every half of every game, no matter who he was playing against. So I think for us to escape out of there with that win, that was like, like I said, that was another big step in the right direction. Another difficult road task awaited LaSalle at Bucknell. The Bison were stacked with a veteran squad, led by future NBA draft pick Mike Muscala. People know who the, the, the national names are in college basketball, but you don't always know that Bucknell is, is going to have a team that can beat Arizona on the road, which is what they did the year before uh, last, or that they're going to have an NBA center. Uh, so we went up there and got beat against a very good team. Despite the loss, Explorer fans got their first taste of a speedy transfer from Virginia Tech, who was chomping at the bit to get on the hardwood for the first time in a year. We saw Tyrone Garland for the first time. Um, coach subbed me in. I was I'm pretty nervous. That was my first game back. And um, I think it was like the first time I touched the ball, the second time, I took a, I took a three. I thought it was a good shot, but it, it missed way off. And, and then when the buzzer rang, I, I just looked straight over because I was so used to coming out. So when I saw I wasn't coming out, I just was like, hey, coach really liked me. He went end to end at the end of the half from baseline to baseline and got a three point play so fast. I didn't know what happened on the radio because he was that fast. And with .6 seconds to play, Tyrone Garland will go to the stripe for two. What a streak wow. of light he was from one end of the court to the other. I didn't Garland's squad returned home and faced the tall task of bouncing back against the Iona Gales. Iona entered the contest averaging nearly 80 points per game, setting up a high-octane affair. It did not disappoint. The first half uh, was described to me by John Rothstein from CBS as the most entertaining half of basketball he saw all year. Mills, alley -oop. this one gets thrown down by It was back and forth. Uh, in the second half, Tyrone Garland really had his breakout game. The Explorers led the track meet 49-46 at the break and used the 19-point second half showing from Garland to create separation and put one in the win column. I just really wanted to get the win because when I came back the first game we lost, I didn't want to seem like I was bad luck or something. I just wanted to get this win. The fix, splits the defense, drives, dishes to Garland, layup good! Whenever Tyrone Garland's man who's guarding him on defense turns his head, Tyrone Garland just cuts to the basket. It sounds so simple, but very few players do this. So Tyrone sees his man on several occasions turn his head. He cuts the basket for layups. And uh, it was neat to see Tyrone have that, that breakthrough game. A Southwest Philly native, Garland starred at John Bartram High School and tallied 2,198 career points, third most in Philadelphia Public League history. His long-awaited homecoming was witnessed by dozens of friends and family members. Tyrone, what did Mike when he got on a roll? He scored 14 straight points at one point in the second half. What was that just like? Oh, you the mean. I don't know. I, I used to do it in high school, so it kind of felt like high school when I was out there. The blue and gold rode the offensive momentum into wins over Sacred Heart and Siena. The 171 win over the Pioneers marked their first and only triple-digit output of the season. They upended Siena a week later to improve their record to 9-2. Breaks free, drives, takes it to the rack, and finishes nicely! Coming off two of their most lopsided wins of the season, the Blue and Gold got to celebrate the turn of the new year in the Sunshine State as they awaited a heavyweight showdown with the Miami Hurricanes. We knew Miami was going to have a very good team. They were picked uh, to be one of the best teams in the ACC last year. But I don't think anyone knew that they would end up being ranked number one in the country for a long period of time. The Explorers jumped on the home team early and held a promising six-point lead at the break. Then the wheels fell off. Sam Mills, Tyreek Dern, Ramon Galley, Tyrone Garland. 
Um, they flat out intimidated other guard corps. And for 20 minutes, the Miami guards could not handle that pressure. There was a look in their eyes. And uh, we led them for the first half. I think we had a lead up until right around uh, the 30 minute mark or 10 minutes left in the game. Then Shane Larkin, who ends up being a first round draft choice, just has a great half, their whole team does. We get on our team really hard after the game because we, it was a game that we thought we could win. Um, but again, as, as the rest of the season would show us, we lost to a really outstanding team in, in, in that game. With their three-game win streak snapped in Coral Gables, the Explorers were antsy to return home for the first time in the new year. A Big Five clash with Penn had special meaning to one of the squad's unsung heroes. Garvin Hunt made a great contribution in that Penn game. I knew that the Penn game would be a big deal from, for Garvin having played there in the past and knowing a lot of people there. Hunt played basketball at Penn for a season before hanging up the sneakers in order to pursue his lifelong goal of being an architect. Upon graduating in May of 2012, Hunt had the itch to play again and transferred to LaSalle to pursue his MBA. A team is not just made up of all conference players. You need depth and you need chemistry, and it always helps to have big, strong bodies. And Garvin gave us a big, strong body. He gave us depth. He, he gave us quality minutes later in the game. And it will not go. There's Garvin Hunt with another offensive rebound falling to the um, ground. Was... But it was great to see Garvin play well against Penn and be rewarded for his efforts and get a win that I know was very meaningful to him. The victory over Penn gave the Explorers a 10-3 record entering Atlantic 10 play, beginning at Charlotte on January 9th. And they led us from beginning to end. It was a very humbling game. Um, I don't think anyone on our team had a particularly great game. Again, all the credit goes to Charlotte, who I think at that point was clearly one of the, the better playing teams in the Atlantic 10 at that point. The road wouldn't get any easier for the Explorers with Richmond on deck in LaSalle's conference home opener. The Spiders entered the game ranked first in the A-10 in three-point field goal percentage and Richmond was just looking great coming into that game. Uh, what we really thought the key to the game against Richmond was was preventing their three-point shooting, was a, a, which was a strength of ours all year long. And I think guys like Sam Mills and DJ Peterson were huge in winning that game, uh, especially on the defensive end. Peterson's defense was well known throughout the conference, but his offensive game may have been the Explorers' best kept secret. He finished the year third in the country in assists to turnover ratio and second on the team in three-point field goal percentage. Peterson and his teammates would have to keep riding high with a desperate Dayton Flyers team coming to town. Dayton dropped its first two A-10 games at the hands of VCU and Butler and visited Gola looking to crack the win column for the first time in their conference season. They were greeted with a rim-rocking performance that sent the Explorer entourage into a frenzy. When uh, the game started, you know, I, I, I had like four dunks in a row, and I wasn't, it just came together like that. I mean, uh, Coach, Coach G told us we could play the passing lane a little bit, don't be afraid to gamble. A couple times I jumped the passing lane, and I had like, a, uh, I think it was like four dunks or three dunks in a row. And then watch this windmill. Oh my goodness. So that young man has an elevator that goes to another level. So it was just, uh, it was great. I mean, the, the energy was, was so high, the intensity was so high, the passion was so high. The visitors maintained a close watch on the lead and trailed by only two at the game's final possession. The game winning heave went awry and the Explorers took their second conference game in five days in front of their home crowd. A third straight A-10 victory looked promising for the Explorers after taking an early 11-point lead at Xavier. The Musketeers answered with a 26-7 run, however, and took an 8-point lead into the half and an ultimate 70-63 win. One of the most pivotal games of the year, I think, was our game at Xavier. Uh, we did not play particularly well. We lost, but after the game, we um, kept our heads up. We didn't want to feel depressed or anything like that. We knew we had Butler coming up. They was ranked top 10 and we knew we had VCU. So we knew we had a tough week. And in that locker room, we do something that we do after every game. Every single game, we talk about our next opponent. We try not to dwell on what just happened, win or lose. Win or lose, we're going to look forward. And the statement in the locker room after that game was that in seven days, we could be the hottest team in the country. And uh, obviously our guys responded wonderfully to that. 
January 23rd versus Butler had been circled on the calendars of many Explorer fans since the day of the schedule release. Entering the game ranked ninth nationally, the Bulldogs were the highest ranked squad to ever visit Gola Arena. We, we got Butler, one of, the, one, of the, one of the biggest programs in NCAA history, you know, coming to LaSalle, you know, coming to the Tom Gola. So who wouldn't be excited, you know? Despite the magnitude of the matchup, the Explorers would begin the game with their leading scorer on the bench. Ramon and I met in the office and I said, Ramon, I'm not going to start you because I want you to have your discipline and your focus at, at the absolute highest level. And uh, he accepted that challenge. So Ramon didn't start, his mind might have not been in the right place, but as a basketball player, you got to kind of like focus and just clear everything out of your mind and just move on to the next. And I think he did that. He started all kind of slow. Um, I just told him to fight through it. You know, he's a strong individual. I had the worst game probably, you know, out of my two years here at LaSalle. But, you know, at the same time, I stuck with it. You know, my teammates stuck with me. You know, the whole game, you know, they kept telling me to shoot. And they kept telling me to play hard. They kept telling me, next play, don't worry about it, get a stop. As the second half was winding down, Tyrone Garland had a simple message for his friend and struggling teammate. Towards the end of the game, I pulled him to the side, I said, you're going to win this game for us. And I remember Todd just telling me, like, listen, keep your head up, you're going to win the game for us. That's exactly what he told me. Galloway's miserable evening was rendered moot with the ball in his hands and his team down one in the game's closing seconds. The ball is in my hand, we didn't have no timeouts. And uh, I kind of get over half court and I kind of glance at Coach G first because there's like eight seconds left on the clock. So I didn't want to go too fast where they can get up another shot. So I kind of paused, looked at Coach G for a second. When I looked at him, he just told me to go. So like by the, me stopping and looking and standing up, I guess it caught the defender like by shot because he kind of like stood up too. So then when I seen Coach G say go, I just went. and. Uh, I didn't care who was there, I didn't. I just laid the ball up. Jones go to the rack, left, good! With 2.7 seconds to go, here comes the inbounds. Smith will inbounds to Jones. Jones from midcourt puts it up, and no good! They've done it! The Explorers have done it! Finally getting over the hump! They defeat the Butler Bulldogs! The highest ranked victory for an Explorer team! The pandemonium of the court storming symbolized the euphoria each Explorer fan in attendance felt at the buzzer. Crowd went crazy, stormed the court. Uh, one of the best moments of my life, actually the best moments of my life. It's, I don't think there's any other feeling than having your crowd rush the floor on you and just seeing how happy everybody is. Like As far as the alumni and then the students, I think people were talking about that game for like the next two, three weeks. But a unique end game scenario gave the entourage an opportunity that made the goal rush even more special. And then all of a sudden, Kevin Casey's telling everybody to get back into the stands. And Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? We would ask all students, please clear the floor. The game is not over. They happened two times because the refs stopped the game. To this day, I don't know how or why they reviewed it because so this that remains one of the more bizarre things that I've experienced on the air. I'm just Galloway's resiliency has always shined through the adversity thrown his way, never exhibited more than in the waning seconds of the biggest win of his college career. I told him, I told you he was gonna do that. He's just that type of player. And just to see him emotional like that just goes to show that um, how much he loved his game, how much he loved his teammates and his family. I just love being around people I consider family and, and by me playing in that game and being around my teammates, it, it did a lot for me because it took my mind off of everything. Like that win took my mind off of a lot that I was going through, that was going on with me and it, it, it meant a lot. Our whole team did a great job, but I think Ramon responding to a challenge, I think Ramon's uh, leadership, uh, I think that Ramon in that game, having the ability to make that great team, that great play is, is something that we'll always remember. With their head in the clouds following the win over Butler, the Explorers faced another monster, 19th ranked VCU and their rabid fan base at the Siegel Center. You know, we, we was riding high, you know, we, we just beat, you know, a, a nationally ranked team. Um, so we had another nationally ranked team coming up, so we felt like, you know, 
why not beat another one? Um, VCU had one of the most hostile crowds that I've ever been a part of. They were, they were getting to me on Twitter before, we, before the game even started, like two days before the game. There were students sleeping out at noon amidst the snow to get the best seats for the game that night. But then, like, as soon as we walked in there, their fans were making noise. It was just, it was just never quiet in that gym, like, from the, from the moment we stepped in. So I knew it was going to be a crazy game. The Rams entered the game leading the nation in steals and turnover margin behind their vaunted Havoc defense. LaSalle's talented guards wreaked havoc of its own on the home team, led by a 31-point barrage from Ramon Galloway. Their pressure in that game was even greater than what we expected. We have great quickness, and uh, what we saw against VCU was, was something that we, we haven't seen in maybe ever. So we spread the floor, and our guards in that game showed why they're at such a high level. So that draws contact and gets the bucket to go. I had a great opportunity to play with, you know, four or five great guards. You know, we all look for each other and we all play together, so. It was going to be our guards versus their guards, and I knew in the own contest when there's a competition like that, that our guards probably had the upper hand. There may be a guard better here and there in the country. Certainly we recognize there's a lot of great guards, but as a group, I thought our guards were the best group of guards in the country, and I think that our success during the year certainly helped to, to validate that point. The victories over Butler and VCU jettisoned the blue and gold into the national spotlight, being named National Team of the Week by ESPN and Sports Illustrated. I actually think that was our turning point of the year when we um, went into VCU and beat them on their home floor because um, basically nobody can do, can do that. It told me that we could play with anybody if we just play together and play smart. Yeah, I think it definitely put us on the map, but I think a lot of our team was still disappointed because we didn't crack the top 25 rankings and that's something, something that we thought we were going to do by beating two top-ranked teams in one week. I mean, not a lot of people can do that. The Explorers were making national headlines, but Mother Nature prevented the team from going into its next game against UMass at 100%. Well, this, this would be a, a plug sometimes for the value of, of charter flights. Um, after the VCU game, we get caught in, in a blizzard coming home, and what should be about a five-hour drive turns out to be about an eight-hour drive. And they get home at four or five in the morning, and their sleep patterns are off. Uh, you're not going to feel great for the next day or two. I mean, if it was up to me, I'd take a charter flight everywhere I went, especially after a game like that. We lost to a great UMass team, uh, one of only two home losses all last year. Um, UMass made a great play at the buzzer to beat us. In all honesty, I don't think we're quite 100% after that really tough back trip back from VCU. The last second loss was a disappointment, but a trip to the nation's capital gave the Explorers a chance to recover. For the first time in 14 years, however, they would be without their voice. I had not missed a LaSalle basketball game since 1999. It happened to be the last time LaSalle played in the Garden. It was against Seton Hall. With his consecutive game streak at 458, Beers elected to attend Mike Cunningham's wedding, his best friend and fellow LaSalle alum, rather than keep his streak alive. Steve Degler, who's one of the best broadcasters in the business, called the game by himself. Listening to LaSalle basketball happen without me there was really weird. I'm still mad that streak's over, that I didn't get to see that game, but like I said, I wouldn't have missed the LaSalle game for anybody else. After beating the Colonials 80-71, to the bye week came at a good time for the Explorers, who welcomed Fordham on February 9th. Bye weeks are very tricky in terms of how you're going to handle them. Tuesday, Wednesday, we went really hard and competitive and tried to make Wednesday like a game day. And then we did our normal game preparation Thursday, Friday, and it really paid off. Uh, we had a huge lead early on against Fordham, and uh, I liked our preparation. I liked our guys' focus, and uh, we just played great in that game. To the rack off the glass, and one for Tyrone Garland. The Rams escaped New York in time to miss the brunt of winter storm Nemo, but were met by a flurry of 18 three-point buckets by LaSalle, tying a program record. 
Sam Mills knocked down a career-high seven threes in the lopsided victory and had been quietly making a name for himself as one of the conference's premier defenders all season long. Sam's a great defender, and since uh, Sam has been at LaSalle, he's been a huge player for us. And, uh, and frankly, we've won a lot of games with Sam out there. He doesn't turn it over. He makes threes. He plays great defense. He's a great teammate. He shares the ball. He plays winning basketball. Pow! Sam Mills opens up a seven-point lead for the Explorers. A trip 300 miles north was the next item on LaSalle's checklist, set to visit St. Bonaventure, considered one of the toughest places to play in the conference. I remember St. Bonaventure, my freshman year, they kind of let us have it, like, all game. This is traditionally a, a really hard place for, for everyone in the A-10 to play. They have a great home court advantage. They really get on you. I've heard them say some pretty funny things to me and my players over the years. Maybe not all suitable for, for videotape, but they get on you, to say the least. Um, we win a close game in overtime. And uh, without that win, we don't make the NCAA tournament. All eyes were now fixated on the St. Joseph's Hawks with the share of the Big Five title up for grabs. Uh, who had a bragging rights in Philly? Like, you know, and for a long time, you know, LaSalle haven't had the bragging rights, you know. And we, we beat Villanova, you know, we, uh, and now it's time to beat St. Joe's. And um, we, we're trying to get the, you know, Big Five championship title. Tyreek Duran and Ramon Galloway combined for 45 points in the effort as the Explorers shot a then season high 62% from the field. The atmosphere at the Palestra was unforgettable as LaSalle knocked off its chief rival 76 to 64 to claim a share of the city for the first time since 1990. Any game at the Palestra brings excitement just cause like you say, it's the cathedral of basketball. So I think any game here is gonna be exciting, but the St. Joe's and LaSalle, I think it was like times five today, times 10. Even though it's not in Goal Arena, I think our fans were tremendous in that game and a big factor in us getting the win. The, the whole atmosphere was live. Every play, you heard people screaming. It wasn't quiet the whole game, like, even during halftime. Despite the win, the Explorers were already looking ahead with a one-track mind. It's bring energy. You know, you got half St. Joe's and half Temple. I mean, half the South. I'm so sorry. I'm worried about Temple. But, um, Good job. <laughs> and we just talked about that. Yeah. Great job. We go to Temple with incredible excitement. Uh, well, Temple is actually the last team on my bucket list. I, we beat every other um, Big Five team except Temple. And we can win the Big Five outright by beating Temple. And it was the first time I think I've seen, ever seen our guys tight. LaSalle had high hopes for a Big Five season sweep, but the Temple Owls had other ideas and used a 19-0 first half surge to squelch the possibility of a road victory for the blue and gold. One player in particular took the Temple loss to heart and used it to inspire his every move the remainder of the season. One of the players who did not have a great game in that day, on that day was Tyrone Garland. So after that game, I'm, I'm pretty critical of Tyrone. And his teammates, Ramon Galloway and Tyreek Dern in particular, really have a great talk with Tyrone, who still has only played for me a little over a month. And they had great leadership and Tyrone responded wonderfully. Frankly, after that game, I think Tyrone was one of the best players, not only for LaSalle, but in the A-10. He, I think he got after me the Temple game, so I came out with a, best, a much more better mindset. What it showed for me with Tyrone was great character. People have bad games and it's all about how you respond. And I think that what Tyrone learned in that game and how he stepped up and how he responded was just huge in our success after the Temple game. With a trip to Rhode Island next on LaSalle's slate, Coach Giannini offered his squad a peek into the future, breaking a personal conviction in the process. The key game was at Rhode Island. Rhode Island had won at St. Louis. They didn't have a great record with a young team, but they had played everyone tough, and it was an extremely dangerous game. Uh, and, and I told our team uh, something that was uncharacteristic for me and going out on a limb a little bit. I said, this is a must-win game. The Rhode Island game, we can't lose if we got dreams of making it to the tournament. He said a Temple game probably would have made sure that we were in, but he said losing to Rhode Island would make sure that we're out. And I told our team this is a must win. If we lose this game, we're not in the NCAA tournament. And if we lost it, I don't think we would have been in the NCAA tournament. The Rams led by three at the break, 
but the Explorers outscored the home team by 10 in the second frame to secure the victory and push their conference record to 9-4. After the win in Kingston, the Explorers had nearly a week off before hosting Duquesne on March 2nd. Their legs were fresh, exhibited by a 50-point first-half outburst, but the mood was spoiled when a big body went crashing to the floor. We have a, a great defensive game and we play great from beginning to end. Um, but something serious happens in that game. Steve Zach goes down with an injury. In my eyes, everything happens for a reason. So as soon as we lose Steve, I think that's just, it was an opportunity for Jarrell to step up and start proving why he should be named up to one of the all 8 10 teams. We had to do what we had to do. We had Rohan and Garvin to step up and I had to play more minutes. So we, we ended up playing um, very well. With Zach out indefinitely, everyone on the team would be asked to step up in the rebounding department. They would get their first chance without Zach against one of the conference's top rebounding squads, George Washington. So we go into George Washington not 100%, and I'm not sure how we're going to play without Steve because we've always had the option of going four guards or playing big um, with Steve being available. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're concerned, but yet we're confident. We believe in our guys. March 6th was a special day for seniors Ramon Galloway and Garvin Hunt, both playing their last game in front of a home crowd at Gola Arena. In college basketball, that's a great tradition. People take it seriously. At LaSalle, we take it extremely seriously. Senior day is always one of my most favorite games, I think, of the season, just because you get to see everybody. I mean, you get to see all your seniors go out for their last game. And you get to see how emotional they are. And I think it just lets you know how important college is to people and like how much they're going to miss it after they're gone. As a little kid, I never ever thought ever if anybody would tell me that I'll be graduating college. I'm not even just talking about basketball. I'm just talking about if anybody ever told me I'd be graduating college, I'll tell you a lie to your face. I just wouldn't believe it. I think it's just one of those emotional days where you got to like just put basketball aside for like five minutes and take time out to think about how important this is and how important life is to you. The meaningful pregame festivity set the tone for the Explorers as they cruised to an 84-70 victory behind 29 points from their fearless leader. I'm going to be my, you know, last game playing home, so, you know, let's win, fellas. Winning on senior day is, is something special. It's the last time that Ramon and Garvin played in Goal Arena, and, and it was so meaningful to send them out winners and, and to keep our dreams of the NCAA tournament alive. Their 11th conference win of the season set a program record and gave the Explorers an opportunity to capture the regular season conference title on March 9th at St. Louis. We, we, we know the game at St. Louis is going to be hard because they're, they're nationally ranked at this time and, and they've been dominant at home. LaSalle hung with the home team, trailing by only one at the half. But the Billikens exploited the lack of Explorer size in the second half all the way to a 78-54 victory. Their strength is really a factor in the game. Cool, St. Louis. Yeah. Um, it's a game that we would have loved to have had, Steve. And, and you just have to give St. Louis all the credit in the world. It was a really hard loss. I think that was the only game I really wanted to cry in because they just kept scoring, kept scoring, kept scoring. We couldn't stop them. We had a chance in the first half. We just slipped up in the second half. And I, I think we learned from that mistake. You know, got things together going into the postseason. With an 11-5 conference mark heading into the postseason, the blue and gold had earned a bye and the four seed in the A-10 playoffs. They would await the winner of Butler Dayton for their second round draw. In my eyes, I think that was the perfect game to end the season on, or to end the regular season on, just because it lets you know what you're about to walk into as far as the A-10 tournament. You're not going to walk into no easy teams. Everybody's going to be giving it their all. I mean, it's either win or go home at that point. LaSalle waited with anticipation, anxious to play in the brand new Barclays Center for the first time. Butler knocked off Dayton, setting up a rematch with the Bulldogs, who did not forget about their run-in earlier in the season. So, of course, we get the Butler Bulldogs again, which is a, an extremely tough opponent. And, and again, we have another tough game, uh, and we end up losing back-to-back -back games. The 69-58 Butler victory sent the Explorers home, where they would be forced to wait 48 hours for Selection Sunday. Despite the season's many successes, 
the bubble was not a comfortable place to be. This wasn't our best game. When Tyreek Dern did, doesn't get an assist, when Sam Mills and Ramon Galloway have a hard time, have one field goal apiece, you, you're not playing your best. Uh, you know, there's no question if we win today, we're, we're in. And now, frankly, we, we might be at the mercy of, of others a little bit. So we kind of was coming off two bad losses, and uh, we didn't want to go out like that. So uh, we was hoping that, you know, our wins during the season got us into Selection Sunday. And let the madness begin. It is Selection Sunday, and Philadelphia is in play. Day. Villanova, Temple, and LaSalle were all on edge all day long, crossing their fingers, hoping, praying they'd make the NCAA tournament. 6 p.m. on Sunday, March 17th, couldn't get here soon enough. The Explorers felt their body of work spoke for itself, but only the opinions of the selection committee carried any weight. A lot of people were texting me like, I hope you make it in. And a lot, some people were texting me saying they knew we were in, but really I knew that nobody knew that we were, that we were in except the um, selection committee. Um, selection sun Sunday was by far the scariest moment. That whole day I just had the jitters. It was like prime, it was like first date. It was just like a scary day. Dozens of media members filed into the Heyman Center, joining the players and coaches eagerly awaiting their postseason fate. Meanwhile, a watch party for the student body was being held across campus in the Dan Rodden Theater. Um, when I saw the media in the conference room as we was watching Selection Sunday, it just, like, I immediately got butterflies in my stomach just because I was so nervous. That was as many uh, reporters as I ever seen, like in like one room. I was so nervous, I had to leave the, the room. I left the room. Uh, I said a little prayer, and, and I came back in the room. So then um, I had Taylor next to me, and um, I was holding his arm like the whole time. It was just like, yo, man, we gotta get caught. <laughs> you just gotta get caught. It was kind of quiet because everybody was like, oh, are we going to get picked, or are we going to make it? Three regions had passed, with no mention of the explorers. But for a fan base that had waited 21 years since its last dance, what was a few more minutes? Regular season title, and they will play the winner of the first round game between Boise State Broncos and the Explorers of LaSalle. The Explorers making their first NCAA tournament appearance since 1992. Yeah. I mean, on film, like you can see us, like when our name got called, you can see Taylor's his uh, leg was all the way up here, and I jumped just as high. So it was just like a great experience. Sitting and, and hearing that cheer and watching that, uh, watching that name came up, it was ten times better than I've ever played it over in my head. It was just everybody was so excited, you know, the whole Philadelphia, you know, was, was watching us. We see that name, it was just like, it was just like a thousand pounds off our shoulders. We were just so happy. We jumped up in joy. Um, it, it just was a great feeling. And uh, to, to have this particular group of kids um, get rewarded for all the effort they put in was just wonderful. It was especially wonderful because they're such a, a likable group of players. I packed my clothes, obviously I didn't get my hair done, so I just washed it and just was on the road. LaSalle snagged one of the last four spots in the tournament field, and they would square off against Boise State on Wednesday, March 20th in Dayton, Ohio. With only three days to prepare for the Broncos, the Explorers flew out of Philadelphia on Monday. They received a bit of news that got the trip started on a high note. We, we got on a plane and uh, the lady told us that it was a Miami Heat playing, and it's like, wow. We already were talking about how it felt like we were in, in the NBA. But then the, the person that's flying the plane tells you who, that's the Heat's playing. Then he's showing you where LeBron James sit, where Dwayne Wade, like where all the superstars sit. I end up sitting right in LeBron's seat, and it was like, that's my favorite player. Just climbing on that jet, and, and uh, just knowing that it was a Miami Heat uh, jet, I was even more excited just to just have that bragging rights like, yeah, I'm from Florida, what's up? On March 20th, 1863, LaSalle received its charter from the state of Pennsylvania. On March 20th, 1954, the Explorers defeated Bradley in the NCAA championship. 
And on March 20th, 2013, LaSalle was ironically in the spotlight again, ready to celebrate Charter Day in style. No coincidence that 150 years ago today, LaSalle University was founded. No coincidence that 59 years ago today, LaSalle won the national championship. Help us learn to continue the tradition to make this a special day for LaSalle basketball. Let us play with pride. St. John Baptist LaSalle, remember us with Jesus in our hearts forever. LaSalle and Boise State had never played each other on the hardwood. But upon first glance, Coach Giannini saw a lot of his team in the upcoming opponent. To me, the shocking thing about Boise State is when I looked at them on tape and I saw another four guard team. I think the two teams were very similar just on that particular night. Uh, our guards were the best guards on the floor. With the script written, the blue and gold delivered a masterful performance, taking down Boise State 80 to 71. As a team, the Explorers shot a season best 63% behind 20-point outings from Ramon Galloway and Tyrone Garland. The Explorers are going on to Kansas City. They didn't just make the tournament, folks. They are advancing. I tell you, I told you we was going to eat the day. Oh, let's get it, boy! You know, we went, we went back in the locker room and we you know, had our little celebration, happiness, jumping, hugging each other, being proud. And then we sat down, Coach G had us talk, and we right back to business, right back in serious mode. While fans back home relished the sweet taste of victory, Coach Giannini and his team were headed to Kansas City. They would take on fourth-seeded Kansas State, less than 130 miles away from its campus. Once again, it's his home place. Basically, you might as well say we played, it was a away game. We playing in Kansas, playing Kansas State, so it's basically their home floor. The noise that was in there was just unbelievable. It sounded like a concert at one point. We've seen places that, that are, are big arenas. We've seen big crowds. We've been in places where you can't hear yourself talk. Uh, but this was at a different level. I mean, it's just you can hear everybody yelling. You can just hear the crowd moving. It's like it was the floor was shaking. It was like like nothing else. You normally don't feel the floor shake from a place being that loud, but when it's 20,000 people, you know, going crazy against you at crunch time, um, it, it, it was pretty intense. At one point, G called a timeout, and we couldn't even understand what he was saying. It was so loud in the gym. So it was, to me, it was like a wasted timeout. We don't even know what he's talking about in the, in the huddle. It was just like we we was on the floor on our own. We had to take care of business because G wasn't going to be on the floor for us. We were prepared. We've been in loud places. We've been in, in intense situations. And this might have been a next step up, but it was a step that our guys were prepared for. What an opportunity we have. What an opportunity. And success, you can't be successful unless you have the opportunity. You guys have earned this opportunity, but more importantly, you're prepared. Be the tougher team, boy, be more together and you'll win. Be tougher and more together and you'll win. Kansas State entered the game as a heavy favorite, but that didn't stop the blue and gold from starting out with a good old-fashioned ambush. Everybody had us down and out. You know, ain't nobody projected us to win. So when I went in there, I told us, listen, we ain't got nothing to lose. You know, let's play with our heart. Let's leave everything out there. We don't have nothing to lose. Southerners, toughness to play to cover, fellas. That's it. Pressure and fans, fellas. Like we normally do, play our game. Let's go, finish on our way. Let's do the thing. Finish up. I ain't gonna lie, when I first got in the game, I was kind of nervous. But I knew um, with my teammates behind me that um, we could do anything and we could win. The K-State game, we jumped out on a big lead. By, we hit a lot of contested threes, a lot of tough shots. I, it's, it's the feeling you have when you play, and I felt like I had it going. And you know, my teammates felt like I had it going, so they kept feeding me, and they, telling me, they told me they kept going. To me, basketball is a game of runs, so we knew that, we were going, that somebody was going to make a run. You didn't know who was going to throw the first punch. It just happened to be us. But when you see us jump out to big leads, it's very simple. People are a little stunned by our quickness. I think a lot of people were surprised how good we were. They understand we LaSalle University, you know, a little, little school in Philadelphia, two blocks. But, you know, we, we, we held our ground. We showed that we were supposed to be there, and uh, we, we matched up well against them. The Explorers knocked down six triples in the first half and led 44-26 behind a 15-point outburst from Ramon Galloway. But entering the second half, 
only one thing was certain. The Wildcats would counterpunch. We went in the locker room, we told everybody, like, yeah, we made our run, but be, be ready for their punch. We know they're going to come out. They're not going to give up. These are really good teams. You know, Kansas State's not going to lose by 20 points to anyone. Not Kansas, not North Carolina. No one on their schedule beats beat them like that. And that's why they were the Big 12 co-champs and number 11 in the country going into the NCAA tournament. So they're going to come back. You're not going to blow them out. I know like, they were destined to make a run. They weren't going to get blown out, especially when your season is on the line and that much is at stake. You're playing on national TV. Nobody's going to give up that easy. We just didn't know they were going to come back like they did. A 34-14 Kansas State run gave the Wildcats their first lead of the game with just over six minutes remaining. After every shot that K-State hit, it would just get louder and louder and louder. And then they finally, G finally called the timeout and that made it ten times worse. The crowd got even louder after that. The Explorers' defense clamped down, allowing only one Wildcat field goal the rest of the way. Meanwhile, Jarrell Wright knocked down the biggest five free throws of his career, giving the Blue and Gold a two-point lead with nine seconds to go. 20 points in all, six for six from the floor. He's not missed a shot. This, he's working on a Christian Leitner right here. As you know, if he, does, if he doesn't make those free throws, we might end up losing by maybe 10 points because I think we only made three baskets that whole half. I think the Boise State game, I shot one for five at the free throw line. And what we, we did with uh, Jarrell and what he did is just try to be more focused. Coach G was saying that I had the perfect form and everything like that. I just needed to think of a word that was going to make me, that was going to make me concentrate better. We just had Jarrell when he got up to the line, stare at the rim and think the word in. Kansas State game, I don't know what happened, but I just thought about that word and every free throw was going in. You're a 60% free throw shooter, but you made nine straight here tonight. Why was it working so well? Uh, the coach just tell me to keep my same form, think about like the same thing every time I shoot the ball, and today I thought about end. He shot the ball great, nine out of ten against Kansas State, uh, with a lot of pressure. And uh, he stepped up in every way. I mean, he helped us out big time. It was by far the best game I ever played and the craziest game. Wright's precision from the charity stripe put the Explorers ahead, but the Wildcats had the ball on the game's final possession, setting up a one-on-one -on -one battle against a pair of familiar foes. And the subplot that I love about this is uh, Angel Rodriguez is uh, a South Florida kid. Angel had the ball and um, I just knew this is what, uh, was like a big play for the game that I had to stop him in order for us to win. He tried to uh, go to the baseline, try to make a floater, and um, I just tried to cut him off as much as possible, just tried to beat him to that spot, so um, just to try to make the shot like, as difficult as possible. You know, it, it doesn't surprise me that Sam stayed in front of him and made him take a tough shot. The game-winning play, that was an individual bat. Sam Mills against 13. Sam Mills shut him down. The things that require great effort, like the kind of things Sam Mills does, those are the things we want to praise. Those are the things we want to recognize. Those are the things that we want to reward. So that's why Sam was the first person that we praised in the locker room after that game. Let's go, Let's go, LaSalle's 63-61 victory busted brackets all over the country. Riding a tidal wave of momentum, the blue and gold would square off in the next round against the SEC champion Ole Miss Rebels. Despite the groundswell of excitement, the Explorers used their day off to hit the books. I think one of the things people don't realize behind the scenes is how seriously we take our, our, our academics at LaSalle. Listen guys. Schoolwork is the key to success. Like when you're just sitting around in a hotel room all day, it got to a point where you want to be in the gym. Where you, if you weren't in the gym, you were 
just with Christine doing study hall, you sleep in your room or something. Our academic advisor, Christine Cahill, who just does an amazing job with our players. So she's a big part of our guys' success off the court and making them more mature and making them more disciplined. And there's no one who believes in the importance of school and education more than Christine Cahill. But uh, she says, listen, I know these guys don't want to go back to class tomorrow. You tell them, you just remind them that if they lose, they're back in class tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So they could go to Sweet 16 or they could be in class. It's their choice. This is real. This is reality. We're either going to be in class at 9 a.m. tomorrow or we're going to be in L.A. in the Sweet 16. That's... That's all you had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Even Christine told me she's all about LA. All right? That was the last thing I told them. And uh, let's face it, what would any kid want to do? They all want to get their degrees. But would you rather be playing in the Staples Center in the Sweet 16 in Los Angeles or in your 9 a.m. philosophy class? The Explorers had been a loose bunch all year long and did not plan on stopping now. I love Ramon Galloway. From the moment they arrived in Kansas City, they were taking it all in and making friends along the way. I noticed the big difference when we beat K-State and then we had Ole Miss. A lot of people were saying how they hate Ole Miss, how they want us to beat them so bad. Uh, I didn't know that those practices were open to your opposing coach as well as the fans. Uh, I'd never been in a tournament where, where that was allowed. So when you have an open practice and the other team's watching you play and you've expended a ton of energy the night before, um, you know, you, you're not going to go through your game plan. You're not going to wear them out either. So it's actually a time to loosen up a little bit. And of course, when our players loosen up, it's, it's a lot of fun. It, there's going to be laughing, there's going to be dancing, and, uh, and people saw that and I think they really liked our team. It's like to me, I think they thought we were the Cinderella team and it seemed like they were all rooting for us. I'm thankful that we got a, a huge fan base and it's not only in Philadelphia. We went to other states and got other people to believe in what we do. Yeah, I met a um, great little kid named Casey. Um, we still have contact. His parents is great, he's great. Um, he's having a great summer, he's check up on me, I check up on him. That's my little guy right there. We, just, we act the same around anybody, like we don't change in front of the cameras or nothing. Like that's just how that's just how we are. We we know we know the, the rights and the wrongs. We just like to have fun. I mean, life too serious and too short to you know to be all uptight all the time. The Rebels boasted an offense that averaged nearly 80 points per game behind sharpshooter Marshall Henderson. Known as much for his antics as his game, Henderson was the nation's third most prolific three-point shooter during the season. Uh, the only real game plan for Ole Miss was Marshall Henderson. G said he could be the reason they win, but he could also be the reason they lose. Uh, we really was focused on the big man. We knew Marshall Henderson was going to take his crazy shots, going to take how many shots he's going to take. He said if we don't let him get off, then our chances of, going, our chances of winning go up by probably 90%. You no, know, uh, everybody kind of made a big deal about, you know, Ramon, how you gonna stop Marshall Henderson? How you gonna stop Marshall Henderson? Listen, when, when a player is gonna take his shots, he's gonna take his shots. The thing is, making every shot contested. The game lived up to its high-flying expectations, with LaSalle maintaining a 40-38 edge at the break. The second half was nip and tuck, producing a 74-74 deadlock in the waning seconds as the Explorers claimed possession. Coach Janini called timeout to draw up one final play. When we called the timeout, I was out of the game. I, I missed two foul shots before that, and I was upset with myself. Um, Coach Bradley told me, he told me, um, when you get in, you're going to make a good play, don't worry about it. Well, G had called the timeout. He told me, just make sure we get the last shot. He wanted the shot with under, I think, five seconds left. So we want, definitely wanted the last shot, number one. Uh, number two, we want to start the, with the ball with, in Tyreek's hands and have him make a decision because he's a great decision maker. Number three, we went with the five guards and, and spread the floor out. Uh, I just felt confident doing that. I subbed Jarrell, so we had five guards in, and Coach just said, just get the best shot as possible because with five of y'all, I know one of y'all would get the right shot. Someone was going to be really open, or there were going to be some big gaps. During the game, I think they blocked my shot about four or five times. But earlier in the game, Ty came over to me and asked me, was the floater open? And I told him, yeah, because they had a one big, he's, he's trying to block everything. So when we got out there, um, the time was running down, and I knew if, 
I wanted to drive. I didn't want to drive from the left side, so I made eye contact with Ramon. And that's why, as you see, if you watch the film of the last play, Ramon starts off on the left side, and then him and Tyrone actually end up switching. Uh, Ty felt like, you know, he had a better angle dribbling from the, uh, from the left side going to the middle. So he, he told me to switch. And when he told me to switch, I had no second guess and not being selfish, not wanting the last shot. You know, I switched with him. We just put the ball in Tyreek's hands and he came to my side and it just went from there. And I told him I was going to drive and just dish it to him. I told him just catch it and drive right to the middle of the lane. Tyrone Garland may be one of the best players I've ever coached at just seeing spaces on the floor and where he can cut to the basket. Two defenders didn't call that switch and Ty got right to the cup. We got him the ball. But when it was when I shot it and I, um, it was sitting on the rim, I was just praying that it rolled in. And he just split it and made uh, the, the famous uh, Southwest Philly floater. Now the five is going. Banks it. Yes! For the lead with two. The explorers of LaSalle have defeated the Rebels of Old Bush. Um, my cousin always told me um, when the defender's blocking the shot, he just always say he used that Southwest floater. So after the game, Craig Sager asked me what you call that shot, and I ain't had no other name, so I just said Southwest floater. Oh, that shot you just made. That's the Southwest Philly floater, man. Shout out to my cousin Burn. Shout out to my mom, BOA, all y'all, man. We out here, Southwest. The Southwest Philly floater. That's the difference in the game, 76-74. Garland's Southwest Philly floater propelled the Explorers into the Sweet 16. Meanwhile, the legend of the floater spread like wildfire in the playgrounds of Garland's youth. This is where the Southwest Philly floater was born, right here at the Myers Rec Center. Tyrone Garland, starting at the age of five, practiced this shot hundreds of times here. And all this floater is, it's a little guy shot, man. I had fun with him when he was younger with it and told him that every good guard from Southwest Philly had one. I mean, Tyrone always in practice, always makes these big plays, so I had like no doubt in mind that he's gonna do something spectacular. After that shot right there, uh, that was one of the best shots that I've seen in my career so far, under pressure. He actually called it a, a Southwest Philly floater, but I, th I thought it was more of a layup, but you know what I'm saying? That, I mean, that's his call. Man, I joke around with Ty every time. I said, Ty, you know that wasn't no floater. Oh uh, yeah, we always joke about that. Like, man, it wasn't a, it wasn't a floater. It was a layup. Even when we go work out, people would say, man, why you call it a floater? You know, it was a layup. Yeah, tell me something. It wasn't a floater. It was a layup. But hey, I had to float it over me somehow to get it, to get it into the basket. To this day, you still got people coming up. Like, I'd be walking with them, and somebody come up like, you the guy, the Southwest Philly floater. I mean, at the end of the day, whatever it was, it worked. So. Like, and, he, and he, he did float it over a big man, so I guess it could. It's like in between, it's like a 50-50. It's a layup slash floater. But we always joke about that, man. I think, that, like I said, I think that's going to go down as one of the most memorable moments in the South history. Meanwhile, Explorer Fever was spreading like wildfire back home, where they had become the center of attention. All uh, the support from uh, LaSalle was just amazing that entire trip. I had friends um, like, uh, messaging me videos of people just ran throughout the streets and everything. It just make you want to go out there and play harder, want to win every game, knowing that we was the last Philly team in it. It was a, a great feeling knowing that, you know, we got a lot of people backing us. Even like Temple fans, St. Joe's fans, everybody from Philly, like wh whoever fans they were, they were just rooting for the South because we was from Philly. It's like you wish you were home, but then again, you realize like, no, nah, I don't wish I was, I was home because if I was home, that means we lost. So it's just like you just want to keep winning and, and keep having your, um, like the LaSalle crowd proud of you. The Explorers were headed to the City of Angels with four days to prepare for the Wichita State Shockers. The opportunity would provide them a chance to play in the Staples Center, a bucket list item for any basketball player. On the first practice, as soon as we walked on the floor, you, like the first thing me and Ramon did, we just looked around, you see all the media, all the cameras and everything, and it's just like, wow, like, we finally made it here. This is every college person's dream. And every kid dream is to play somewhere that you, one of your favorite players or a legend played at. This is where the Mamba plays. You know what I mean? 
Kobe. Yeah, for me, playing in the Staples Center was definitely big because I'm a big Kobe Bryant fan. I'm a big Lakers fan. So just being on the same court that your favorite player has been playing on for his whole career is just, you just look at it like, yeah, this is a dream come true. You gotta have a good game. Anything possible, man. LaSalle's time in LA would not be spent alone, as hundreds of alumni, students, and fans made the trip to support their team. One legendary explorer in particular was reliving his college memories and enjoying the ride. Here's the past, here's the present, and the future. Uh, Lionel is a great guy. Um, like everybody knows his history of how he's one of the top scorers in CA. So just having him there, he just served as a uh, motivating factor for us. Um, when you make it that far in the tournament and then you start seeing like old alumni come back supporting you, it just gives you that good feeling, especially when you see somebody that's been there, that, that's made it as far as you did, that, that has been somewhere where you're trying to go. It just gives you that much more confidence that you can actually do it. Man right there, they were 30 and 2, top 11 in the country, best record in the country. It's all coming back, baby. Thanks yes, to you sir. guys. People saw Lionel Simmons traveling with us, and he's like so many LaSalle greats. He loves LaSalle. His memories are of winning. His memories are of pride. And he always told me, Coach, I'm going to be at games. I'm going to support you. But if you get to the NCAA tournament, I want to be with you every step of the way. And sure enough, he was. But I think what Lionel was was just a very visible microcosm of the LaSalle community. Uh, he had old timers from as far back as alums are alive at this school making trips out to Los Angeles. You're really overwhelmed when someone like Jeff Boyle comes 2,000 miles from, from Hong Kong uh, to see a play. You're really overwhelmed when you have students drive across the country or try to raise money to, to make that trip um, because you realize how much they care about LaSalle. You realize how much they care about your team and, and at that point you so much don't want to let them down. With a few days to catch their breath before their next game, the Explorers had a chance to take in the big city. Their East Coast swag was on full display on the streets of Santa Monica. Live from Santa Monica, California. Yeah, hey. It was just an amazing feeling being over in California. I never went to California. That was my first time over there. So yeah, that was the first time I actually really got, got to go out there and experience stuff. I kind of was happy that, that we went out there early because we had days, you know, just to walk around, see California. We're in California and people are honking at us when they see the LaSalle shirts and, and that they are known throughout the country at this point because the NCAA tournament is that big a stage. Coach Giannini's decision to go straight to L.A. rather than return home allowed his team an extra day of practice. The Explorer scout team would once again prepare their teammates for their next game as they had done all year long. A lot of times people know what the Tyreek Durans are doing, the Ramon Galloways are doing, but O.J. Lewis and a few other guys that, that work as a scout team, and they, they do an amazing job. And they have to learn what another team does in a day or two and actually execute it. And then we tell our guys how we're going to guard it, and we walk through it over and over and over again. But O.J. Lewis goes at our guys hard in practice. He prepares our guys. He has great quickness, great heart. Uh, and I think you could see in our behind the scenes video, he was a big part of the spirit of our team. Wichita State was coming off a six-point victory over Gonzaga, the top seed in the region, and promised to be a handful for the Explorers. A 14-2 shocker run at the start of the game put the blue and gold behind the eight ball and never recovered. They hit us hard the first two minutes of the game before we knew it, we were down to nothing. Certainly you would have liked to have gotten off to a better start, but I think Wichita State had an awful lot to do with that. From the lead that they gained in the first half, we couldn't bounce back. I mean, in the second half, I think we won the second half, but they got so much of a lead in the first half, it just couldn't, you know, we, could, we couldn't catch up. LaSalle hit a buzzsaw, falling 72-58 to to Wichita State. But the Explorers exited the court that day with their heads held high. I think you look at any game, like any game that you lose, you look back and say, wow, we could have did this better, we could have did this in the beginning. It might have had different results, but at the end, you never know how it would have went. Like, I think that's just how things go. Dick Girardi, who has seen as much college basketball as anyone, said when he watched Louisville, Wichita State, he said Louisville was the only team that would have beat Wichita State that day. Wichita State was that good. At the end of the day, you know, 
We made a good run. People didn't believe that we was going to get there, and uh, we got there. Just sitting back and looking at what we did, it just was great. And it shows that teamwork means everything, because um, each and every player has something to do with us getting that far. And each and every game, somebody else stepped up. In two weeks' time, the Explorers heard their name called on Selection Sunday for the first time in 21 years, traveled over 5,400 miles, and played four NCAA tournament games during a magical Sweet 16 run. The team went from 0 to 16 in six days. It's never been done in LaSalle history. We just witnessed history happen. From the day we got called to the last game with Wichita State was one big memory that I would cherish for the rest of my life. Like you, when you're away for that long with your teammates, it's like you just grow with them. Like they become like really your family. This is a great feeling to know that you left a positive, you know, something, something for people to be happy about, something for people to be, to, to brag about and build on. The well-traveled explorers returned home and were greeted with a hero's welcome. When we got back to camp, it's, it's like we had, we had the feeling that, oh man, we lost. We, a lot of people were a little depressed. And then we pulled up in the parking lot and you see all those students out there cheering for you. Just, it's like you relive that whole experience over again. You, you remember how happy you were when you were winning, when you, when you hit the buzzer beater, when you knock off a top 10 team. It's just like we relive that whole experience in like that 10 minutes that we were in the parking lot with our fans. We had the whole LaSalle community just happy that we um, made it that far. There wasn't, wasn't nobody talking about how we lost or anything like that. It just was excited that we put LaSalle back on the map. It, it was a wonderful feeling to come back and see the people there to greet us. And it made it more powerful that we were on, on spring break. This was a situation where people were home and they wanted to, to drive to campus to show these kids how much they appreciated them. The high-fiving, the, the response that our people gave to our, to our, our team was, um, that was awesome. That was really awesome. We wanted to make a step towards, you know, uh, bringing back a program or kind of, you know, bringing back greatness. And, uh, you know, I, always, I just wanted to win and I wanted to be a winner. The rich history of the LaSalle basketball program had added another chapter to its storied past. The names of this Explorers team would become synonymous with the likes of Tom Gola, Lionel Simmons, and all the greats that had come before them.